Okay, so we're gonna get started now. All right, so uh, welcome to the first Compass Lecture of the semester. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, our first speaker this week is Diego Navoa. Um, Diego was born and raised in Juneau, Alaska. After spending a few years jumping around major universities in Alaska, he ended up at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, where after six years and four different schools, he got his degree in chemistry with a minor in math. Near the end of his undergraduate education, he realized chemistry was too messy and complex for him and found a passion for the field of ultra cold physics, where when you do chemistry, your reagents are under pressure, under precise quantum state control. The interest, uh, the interest led him to join the group of Dan Stamperkern, where he proceeded to move even further away from chemistry by dispensing, dispensing with the molecules and focusing on, uh, on neutral atoms. He now works with some amazing lab mates, trying to bring a new element to uh, ultra cold temperatures. Uh, when Diego's not looking at titanium atoms, you can find him climbing rocks or jumping in mosh pits. So let's give a warm, a warm welcome to our first speaker. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, as was mentioned, I'm uh, Diego. Uh, I'm in uh, Dan Stamperkern's Ultra Cold Atoms group. And today I will be uh, talking about ultra cold titanium, AKA uh, our quest to bring a new element to quantum degeneracy. So first off, um, that's a lot of fancy words. Uh, what is quantum degeneracy? What's a quantum degenerate gas? In a nutshell, this is a gas with a macroscopic number of identical particles in the uh, absolute ground state. So for atoms, this would be electronic and motional. For molecules, it would be vibrational, rotational, electronic, motional, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's what it is. How do you make one of these systems? Well, imagine a box of, say, helium atoms at room temperature, which for our purposes is high temperature. Each individual helium atom is indistinguishable. If you took any two of these atoms and put them next to each other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if you swapped their positions. However, in this room temperature box, they are distinguishable because as you can see, they all have different velocity vectors. They're distinguishable by their motional states. And then you know, a small fraction of them might have excited electrons. And so those are also distinguishable by their electronic states. Um, so you can actually tell each of these atoms apart if you were, you know, some omnipotent being. So now let's get this uh, high temperature, low density gas of helium atoms colder. Um, hopefully we're all familiar with the wave particle duality idea, which says that, you know, in some contexts matter behaves like waves, in some contexts it behaves like particles. Um, Turns out that actually it always behaved like waves and sometimes it pretends to behave like particles, but we'll, we'll gloss over that. Um, needless to say, the, the wavelength of uh, an atom is dependent on its temperature. And so as you lower the temperature, the atom's wavelength gets longer. Um, this is actually really cool because this is basically a direct um, demonstration of the position momentum uncertainty principle. As we get the atoms colder and colder, we become more certain of their momentum. And so we become less certain of their position. The them like their wavelength growing doesn't mean the atom itself is growing larger. It means the, the range of spatial positions where you have a probability of finding that atom is getting larger. Okay, so that's cool. And now we have a uh, you know box of gas uh, atoms that are behaving like squiggly waves instead of uh, billiard balls. But that's nothing you know, too special. If you measure this, you're still just going to see you know, a system that behaves like individual atoms. But now let's increase the density and get these atoms closer together. Now something cool starts happening, which is that for some of these atoms, the distance between the atoms is shorter than the wavelength of the atoms. And as we're hopefully familiar with, um, waves can add constructively and destructively. And so these matter wave functions add to start giving you this uh, you know, macro, like larger atom wave. And finally, at a critical uh, temperature and density, you get basically complete overlap of your atom waves. The average interparticle distance is smaller than the wavelength of the atoms. And you get this system that basically behaves like a single gigantic atom. And so this is a quantum degenerate gas. Um, it's one of the precious few examples of a macroscopic fully quantum mechanical system. So normally we expect 
only very tiny things to behave observably quantum mechanically, like electrons and atoms. You know, you wouldn't expect, you know, to look at that chair and then you look away and look back at it and it has a different position. Um, you know, you, the effects of quantum mechanics are negligible. In these systems, you know, Bose-Einstein condensates, if you're condensing bosons or with fermions, uh, Fermi gases are special in that uh, amongst uh, superfluid helium and superconductors, they are one of the few examples of a macroscopic system that behaves completely quantum mechanically. Okay, we've made this ultra cold system, great. Now, what do we do with it? Uh, the answer is a lot of really crazy cool stuff. So um, one thing we can do is quantum metrology. So uh, quantum measurement and sensing. Um, one, one great example of this is atomic clocks, which are basically the most precise timekeeping instruments that exist on the planet. Um, you can do matter wave interferometry, um, some of y'all might be, be familiar with laser interferometry, which takes advantage of, um, you know, the fact that when uh, laser beams overlap, if they're in phase, they add constructively. If they're out of phase, they uh, add destructively. Um, with matter wave interferometry, you could literally take a gas of cold atoms, drop it, like literally just let go of it and drop it, split the cloud into two different clouds that each undergo, um, that each feel some different field and then recombine them. And the difference in the atoms will give you some interference pattern that you can use to make incredibly sensitive measurements. You can do ultra cold chemistry where, um, as was mentioned in the intro, uh, your reactants are, can be in a very a precise quantum state. So you can do actually, and you can do quantum state readout of your products. So you can do kind of fully resolved single, uh, single atom, single molecule, chemistry, um, or you could do quantum simulation where you have, you mimic a uh, solid state material where there's some periodic potential made by the ions that's occupied by electrons. The electrons evolve under, you know, some many body uh, uh, Hamiltonian and then um, give you the behavior of your material. In an optical, in, in the ultra cold analogy, you make a periodic potential with light by interfering two lasers. And those, uh, those lattice sites are occupied by atoms that mimic the behavior of electrons in the solid. So that's just kind of a small taste of what can be done with ultra cold atoms. Lots of really cool stuff. And this is kind of the tip of the, I would say iceberg, but ice is way too warm. This is the tip of the Bose-Einstein condensate berg, I suppose. Um, okay, so what, to get an idea of why we might want to make an ultra cold gas of titanium, let's take a look at the current periodic table of, um, of ultra cold atoms. So we see most of the alkali atoms on here, several alkaline earth atoms, one transition metal, chromium, one noble gas, helium, and then several uh, lanthanides. And we can roughly break this uh, periodic table up into two different categories. One is the spherical atoms. So uh, needless to say, these are atoms with zero ground state angular momentum, which importantly means that their electrons are, their electronic clouds are spherically symmetric. This means they're relatively simple. And simple things are good because you can use them to study lots of like very fundamental uh, systems. So basic quantum mechanics, uh, quantum stat mech, like you can, you can do really uh, cool fundamental studies of these systems. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, there's the famous uh, spherical cow approximation. You could probably guess the mass of a cow pretty accurately from a spherical cow, but you're never going to get milk from it. So on the other hand, we also want more complicated things. Um, so that's where these other atoms come in. Um, they are not so simple. They have non-zero ground state angular momentum. And this lets you more easily generate complex behavior in these atoms. However, in order to, um, there's some physics you might wanna do where your atoms are in a mixture of spin states. Say, you know, one half is spin up, one half is spin down. And these more complicated atoms have uh, interactions between them that tend to flip your spins and align them. And so this puts limits on the physics you can do um, if you want a spin mixture. On the other hand, these spherical atoms don't really have these interactions that polarize your spins, but generating complex behavior in them is more difficult. Um, so that's where titanium comes in. 
Titanium is kind of the Goldilocks element where it's kind of complicated. Um, it does have non-zero ground state angular momentum, but it's also got a small magnetic moment um, on the order of that of an alkali atom. And this is what leads to that interaction that flips spins. So titanium might be a really simple route to, um, to studying this regime of physics that's much more difficult to access with, um, e with either of these gases. So, okay, woo, titanium, it's great, right? Right? Well, let's also ask why not titanium? Why hasn't this been done before? And the answer to that is laser cooling is difficult. So to further expand on this, let's first kind of go through the process of how laser cooling works. So first you might, you generate a atomic beam of atoms. To be very optimistic, let's say this is titanium. Um, so you basically, you might have a box full of gaseous titanium and you might say, gaseous titanium, how do you get titanium into a gas? And don't worry, I'll spend a lot of time telling you about that. Um, you might have a box full of gaseous titanium and you poke a hole into one of the sides of the box and now you get atoms coming out with all of their momentum in one direction. Let's call it the Z direction. Next, you send in a laser uh, that's resonant with an electronic transition in these atoms, counter -propagated. So, okay, one of the photons from the laser sees the atom or the atom sees it, I guess there's a philosophical question for you, um, and excites an electron to a higher energy level. Okay, we're all familiar with that. But what we almost always neglect in this process is the fact that that photon actually carries momentum and momentum is conserved. So when this photon is absorbed, its, fo its momentum has to go somewhere and that somewhere is the atom. So if the atom is initially moving with this momentum vector in the plus Z direction and gets this kick in the opposite direction, its final momentum vector is slightly smaller. It's slowed down a little bit, but not very much because compared to an atom moving at room temperature, a photon doesn't have uh, very much momentum. So, but we've slowed it a little bit, so that's great. On the other hand, you might say, wait a minute, Diego, the electron also decays and the atom emits a photon of the same frequency and momentum but in a random direction, this emission is a, is a spontaneous process. And now it gets a heating kick that's sending it in the wrong direction. Like this is bad, right? Our trap is over here and now our atom's going this way. So you might say we're doomed, but don't worry. You have to scatter many photons to cool your atoms because a photon has a much smaller momentum than the atom. And so over the course of 10,000, 100,000 um, cooling kicks, all of your cooling kicks are in the Z direction and have a net slowing effect. And your heating kicks, for every random heating kick that happens this way, another one happens in the opposite direction. So they wind up canceling out. You do get some second order heating effects, but it's nothing you're too worried about. And you wind up with a laser cooled beam of atoms. So in order to do this, right, as I said, we need to cycle many photons. And so we need what's called a laser cooling transition. This is basically just a transition. It's, uh, you could call it a cycling transition because it's, you just basically want your atom to behave like a two-level system. You want it to have this state and this state and not have to worry about any other junk. And so the atom will be excited into this state, decay back down to this state, be able to be excited again because it's still on resonance with the laser cooling transition and cycle photons on and on. But atoms are not always this simple. And maybe there's some off resonant state that this electron can decay into. And that's bad because clearly this electron is now off resonance with our laser cooling light. And in the lack of anything else happening, this atom will now just cease being slowed and fly through our apparatus to be lost. Um, what we can do, so, okay, there's a few different cases. There's the case where your atom is approximately a two level system. So the alkali atoms are kind of like this. They have, or they're exactly like this. They have a single valence electron in an S shell, relatively simple electronic structure, and you can basically just cycle all the photons you want. Life is good and you're happy. Um, the second case is you have low but non negligible leakage to other states. So in this case, you know, every so often, maybe you scatter a thousand photons and then your electron goes to this state. And what you can do is apply what's called a repump laser that is resonant with this transition and sends this electron back into the cooling cycle. And again, you're happy and life is good. The third case is you have non-negligible decay to many states. And life is not good in this case, and you're very sad. 
uh, because you need many repump lasers. And, you know, saying you work with lasers is really cool, but you get to say that when you work with one laser. So you don't want laser. You don't want to work with 10 because that's just expensive and annoying. Um, and so it turns out that titanium in the ground state fits into case number three. Life is bad and we're sad. Um, it has a very complicated uh, electronic spectrum in the ground state. So here's the ground state electronic structure of titanium. Um, here's the basically most viable laser cooling transition out of the ground state. And all these bolded states are the ones that have a probability of this electron decaying to them. So by the end of the day, to do a ground state titanium laser cooling experiment, we'd need like nine or 10 repump lasers. We'd all be very sad and, and life would not be good. And so, um, you, so it's like, okay, well, that's not worth the trouble. Let's just, let's just go on and do something else. But the key insight of our group was to notice that titanium actually has a metastable excited state right here above the ground state that does possess a laser cooling transition. Um, now this metastable excited state has a lifetime that we predict to be on the order of, of actually hours, which is plenty of time to do a laser cooling experiment. And this, uh, this transition should be very near cycling, letting us scatter enough photons to laser cool titanium without maybe even needing a one repump laser. And so there's something, uh, so this is really cool. That's excellent. Um, we're very happy about that. Um, one of the cool things here is actually that even though, so this is the electronic uh, structure of the metastable state, but even though this is how the states are energetically ordered, the size of the shell goes by the um, principal quantum number. And so the 4s electron is actually larger in spatial extent than the 3d electrons. And so when a photon comes in, it basically sees an atom with a single 4s valence electron. This looks a lot like an alkali atom. And it's no coincidence that this cooling line looks a lot like the cooling lines that you see in alkali atoms. Now, if we go back, not forward, um, similarly, this 4s shell with two valence electrons is largest in spatial extent, and titanium's ground state spectrum looks kind of like an alkaline earth atom, which are already complicated and need several repump lasers. And then these two d electrons make things even more complicated and make you sad. So, okay, great. We have our uh, fancy laser cooling transition. Life is good. We can... Uh, just need to generate an atomic beam of titanium and, um, and we're good to go. So briefly though, let's run through the next couple steps of, of how you reach quantum degeneracy. So laser cooling your atoms is great, but it's really just kind of a, a prerequisite to get all the way to ultra cold temperatures, which are like nano -calvins. So after you've laser cooled your atoms, you'll trap them in what's called a magneto optical trap. And it's just what it sounds like. You use a combined potential of six counter-propagating laser beams and magnetic coils to trap your atoms uh, in space. The this is why this trap is comparatively weak. So take an ion trap. You're, you have charged particles interacting with electric fields and that's a very strong interaction. Here you have neutral atoms interacting with, uh, with optical and uh, magnetic fields and this is a much weaker interaction. So if you just sent a, a hot beam of atoms in here, they'd all go straight through and almost none of them would be caught. And so you need to kind of laser pre-cool them to get them to low enough energies to catch. Um, so after you do this, you, you might do some, you know, further uh, fancy cooling in your magneto optical trap and then turn the MOT off and turn on what's called an optical dipole trap. This is basically just a trap that leverages an interaction with the atoms and, um, and light, which makes it lowest the lowest energy configuration of these atoms to be sitting in the center of this laser beam um and so you wind up effectively trapping your well not effectively you do wind up trapping your atoms so once you have an odt you'll do uh evaporative cooling which is basically exactly what it sounds like you know you leave a hot cup of coffee on uh on the table the hottest particles evaporate the cold the, the remaining particles thermalize and you have an older overall colder cup of coffee and you're set so here you have some trap, right, of some energy depth that's holding your atoms. And you can tune the intensity of your light to lower the depth of your trap. The hottest atoms escape. And if the remaining atoms re-thermalize correctly, then you're left with an overall colder sample, except for in this case, you're happy. 
And that by doing that continuously, if you start with enough atoms, um, you can reach the temperatures and densities to uh, achieve Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, great. So we get our beam of titanium atoms. We use our fancy innovative uh, laser cooling scheme to uh, get them cold enough to catch in a MOT. And then we make a MOT and transfer to an ODT and do all this and we're happy. Um, but again, critically, uh, when I tell people about this project, the most surprising thing to them is, is almost always not, whoa, you are gonna do fancy metastable laser cooling or whoa, MOT, what's that? It's usually a gas of titanium, what? And it uh, turns out that that's for very good reason. Uh, titanium being a uh, very robust and uh, strong metal, you know, it's used in aerospace ap applications. It's used in construction. I have a plate of titanium in my collarbone from when I snapped it. Like it's a, it's a very durable metal. And it turns out to be very hard to get it into the gas phase. And so the last two years basically has been de uh, devoted to developing a beam source that's suitable for ultra cold atomic physics studies. So this is the, currently our laser table. Um, we have more vacuum chambers than you usually expect a, a, an AMO experiment to have, I suppose. And uh, one by one, they are an ablation test cell, the tie ball chamber, and a 2D MOT chamber. And I'll kind of explain one by one um, what each of these guys is and does. Uh, so I'll start with the tie ball. This is the source I've been developing. Um, so as the name you know, uh, precludes, we have a ball of titanium on a stick. Uh, there's a tungsten filament in the center of this ball of titanium, and you run current through this conductor up through the filament and out the other side, you heat the filament resistively. This then heats the tie ball, which starts sublimating titanium. And this is kind of funny because normally this is used as an ultra high vacuum pump called the getter pump, where if you have a stainless steel vacuum chamber and coated in titanium, a particle that would have bounced off your stainless steel will react with and stick to the titanium effectively pumping out of the chamber. So this is kind of just like a standard, like, you know, a couple hundred dollar ultra high vacuum pump. Everybody has them. Um, it turns, but, you know, very crucially before your titanium deposits on the vacuum chamber, it's in the gas phase. And so what we did was take this tie ball and kind of um, put it into this vacuum chamber. So these are the, the, uh, the electrical connections and you've got the tie ball kind of right in here, it's behind this aperture that prevents, uh, prevents it from titanium from coating the viewports so we have optical access. And this is kind of like a down the barrel look at the tie ball glowing. Um, and uh, you just ramp the current up, it gets really hot and starts sending gas phase titanium out of this, uh, out of this aperture. And so this is the current setup. Um, we have these windows here for optical access, so we can do uh, fluorescence spectroscopy, where you know your atom interacts with the lasers. They uh, they absorb photons, and when they emit the photons, as mentioned in the laser cooling uh, part, they emit them in every direction, kind of randomly and equally. And so, if you can um, wow. if you can get image enough photons underneath, you can get a really great image of your beam. So that's exactly what we do. The atoms in the middle of this chamber are fluorescing when we send the laser through them. And then there's a series of lenses that image the, the beam onto this camera. And lo and behold, we see a ground state beam of titanium. Um, this has kind of lost its charm at this point because we've made steps forward, thank God. But uh, you should have seen me when I saw this signal uh, last September. I, uh, it was, I was definitely jumping up and down and hooting and hollering because it's been a long journey. So that's awesome. We see our ground state beam. The next step is to detect the thermal metastable beam. So um, the metastable state lies high enough in energy above the ground state that you're not going to get a very significant excited population just from the temperatures present in the tie ball. Um, but nonetheless, we hope we can you know, see a thermal population. And sure enough, if you really squint and look close, uh, well, you can't. It's, uh, it's here, I promise you. Uh, so our, this is our nice laser cooling light, this 498 nanometer teal light. And, um, and yeah, it's, you know, okay, this is right. It's not good. It's not a lot of atoms. Um, I promise you it's there because you can scan the laser back and forth and effectively address different, um, different classes of atoms. And you can watch a signal that is present if you really look close and squint, move back and forth. 
It is, there, there are atoms there. But there's just very few of them. So the next step is to use a third higher energy state that's connected to both your ground state and your metastable state to optically pump your atoms into the metastable excited state. And that's exactly what we did. So this is our 391 nanometer optical pumping light. Um, it goes through all these fancy optics and then uh, goes through the vacuum chamber. And so we have this blue pumping light here that will interact with atoms and then they'll travel to the, uh, well, also blue kind of teal 498 imaging light where hopefully we'll see them. And lo and behold, we get a, a signal of atoms that is not too substantial, but is far, far, far more substantial than the thermal metastable beam. So this is uh, kind of a proof of principle that optical pumping works. We have a significant population of metastable atoms and we're very happy. So um, this is the first step towards this laser cooling experiment. Um, so this is the current state of affairs and the next things to do are characterize this beam um, and, and really do, do everything we can to optimize this optical pumping and then, um, and then hopefully do laser cooling on, the, on these atoms. Um, so on the other hand, uh, we also have a beam source based on laser ablation. This is where you take a very high energy laser, usually 532 nanometers, and you focus it tightly down onto a spot and uh, called an ablation target. So in this case, for us, it would be a puck of titanium. And it's so high energy that you actually blast off a plasma of atoms. And this plasma of atoms gets caught in a buffer gas that's surrounding it. In our case, this is argon. The plasma recombines, thermalizes with the argon and cools down and then can escape through an aperture where you have a beam now of buffer gas and, uh, and atoms. This has an added benefit of um, having being at such high energies that you know in this plasma, your titanium is in all kinds of high lying energy states. And as those slowly decay down towards the ground state, about 10% of your population gets caught in the metastable excited state. So you wind up with a significant population of laser global atoms for free. You don't need the second uh, optical pumping uh, laser. And so now you have, so now we have a beam of argon, which is bad, ground state titanium, which is bad, and metastable titanium, which is good. And in order to separate the bad from the good, we're going to send it into what's called a 2D magneto optical trap. So this works exactly analogously to how the 3D magneto optical trap works. But you can imagine removing two of the beams from the along one axis from the 3D mod, and your atoms will now be trapped in two directions and free to move in a third. And that's exactly what this does. If we send a beam of atoms into this 2D mod, they'll be cooled in these two directions, say X and Y, but in the Z direction, they'll be free to move. And so they'll kind of come in, be cooled, but also escape. Um, in a little tube out this direction. And this is really nice because the argon atoms don't interact with the cooling light. The ground state titanium atoms don't interact with the cooling light. So they just travel straight through this chamber into a pump. Only the metastable titanium interacts with the 2D mod and, and uh, kind of comes out in this tube of atoms. And it comes out prefer non-preferentially either direction and so you apply just another laser beam that uses you know, a light matter interaction to actually push the atoms towards the direction you want them to go, which will go to a higher vacuum chamber that will have a 3D mod in. And so this is kind of the current state of affairs on the 2D mod. Um, we've built this chamber. This is a really cool kind of custom chamber that we got from the chemistry machine shop. Um, this is what it will look like when we're actually sending our cooling light into these uh, into these cool like crossed uh, crossed mod axes. Um, and then this is the current state of affairs where we have lots of optics for our ablation laser. Um, we have some optics for imaging of the, of the titanium atoms in the cell and making sure we have a beam. And then you can see all of the magneto optical trap optics here and these nice magnetic coils that we wound by putting this entire chamber minus this big thing over here onto a lathe in the machine shop and basically just sitting there and winding coils around it instead of having to reach across the table. So that's the current state of affairs. Uh, we're very excited to have 
two metastable beams of titanium instead of zero. Uh, it's, you know, infinitely more. Um, and we are, we're just getting started on aligning these optics for the 2D magneto optical trap. And within a couple of weeks, we hope to be actually testing this trap um, and God forbid, demonstrating laser cooling of titanium. And then uh, with the tie sub chamber, we'll be um, characterizing this beam, writing up a paper on those results and then figure out it's laser cooling of its own. Um, so that's the current state of affairs. Um, so then additionally, uh, one of the kind of prompts for this talk was to talk a bit about uh, the, your journey on the way to graduate school. And most of you here know me, but, and uh, know about this, but I figure I'll go through this anyway for fun. So the journey, as most of you know, I was not always somebody you would be expecting to do a PhD. Um, I was basically a straight C student in middle school. And then I got to high school and was again, basically a straight C student. I think I skipped probably a quarter of my classes my senior year of high school. But then I got to college. And again, I was a straight C student for my first year and a half. Um, I had many more priorities than studying. And I, I thought most of the classes I was taking were pretty boring and inane. So, um, so I didn't go, but some, some, somehow I, I went into college knowing that I wanted to do science. I initially, uh, declared a, as a biology major because I was like biology sounds cool and I want to do science so I guess I'll do that and then I failed intro bio like the first class I got a d in it it's actually the only d I've gotten in college and I was like well that was kind of funny uh but uh luckily I took a chemistry class my sophomore year of high school uh high, uh, high school or sorry sophomore year of, of college high school chemistry and somewhere in the middle of the semester I looked, I kind of sat back while I was doing homework and I was like, this is funny. I don't hate this. And actually it turns out I really, really liked it. Um, so four years later, uh, six years, four different schools recall, I got a degree in chem and got into UC Berkeley. Um, and so, you know, for any uh, undergrads that might be watching and not knowing what you want to do yet, um, the point I want to make with this is that if, and I guess all of you too, is that if you're passionate about something and you're interested in it, don't let anyone, very least of all yourself, convince you that you're not capable of pursuing it. Um, I guarantee you that for anyone here, like if I can make it from uh, a 2.4 GPA my first semester of college to UC Berkeley, then uh, you can also do pretty cool things. Um, second, so second of all, uh, near the end of, end of my undergrad, I came full circle and I realized I actually didn't really like chemistry that much. Um, it's fun and it's interesting, but it's way too complicated. There's too many degrees of freedom. At first I was like, you know, what, you're telling me I'm gonna, I'm gonna take two beakers full of trillions of particles, mix them together into one beaker and have these like trillions on trillions of particles interacting and rotating and vibrating and reacting. And you're gonna, you, I'm gonna pretend to know how to go, I'm go, I know what's going on in that system. That just was excruciating to me. And so I learned about ultra cold atomic physics um, where systems are under quantum state control. Your atoms are so, you know, your atoms are so cold that they're just sitting there. And that's a nice, simple system that I can wrap my head around. So, um, so I realized that I uh, wanted to do this. And I, I came to Berkeley and I joined Dan Stamper Kern's Ultra Cold Atomic Physics Group. Um, after a couple of years in the AMO department, I now think that, that any of the professors would have been happy to take me on. But I was luckily that Dan was willing to bank on a chemist with no physics lab experience no, almost no physics coursework, uh, failed the first two physical chemistry classes, but really thought ultra cold atoms were really cool. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I knew coming from a chemistry degree to an experimental atomic physics group was gonna be really difficult. It's been way harder than that. Uh, and it still is tough, but you grow to meet these things and, and learning curves, you know, get, get a bit less steep. Um, the point I want to make being, uh, it's okay to be bad at something. It's fun to know what you're doing and it's great to like feel confident, like, you know, actually do stuff. But far more important than that is learning, persevering and loving what you're doing. And at some point, you know, I really liked organic chemistry. I had a ton of fun in the class. It, the way I approached it, it really made sense to me. I think I could have learned to be good at the lab technique. Like, I think I could have been a stellar organic chemist, but I just, didn't want to. I decided that I'd rather be a shitty atomic physicist. And so uh, here we are. So uh, 
So in summary, a cold gas, an ultra cold gas of titanium would open the door to some cool novel simulations of quantum matter. That was all in the wrong uh, order, but you get the gist. In addition to other applications such as optical clocks and, and ultra cold chemistry, um, laser cooling is the major bottleneck. And we've identified a fancy scheme to laser cool titanium. And we now have two beams of metastable state atoms. So the next uh, step is to actually cool things. And then believe in yourself. So I'd like to acknowledge my team, um, my, uh, my lab mates, Jack ablation Shot and Scott Postdoc Eustace, um, our awesome undergrad, Matthew Tellurium Bellata, and our PI, Dan Ultracold Stamper Kern. Um, our funders, uh, the Army Research Office, DARPA and uh, Quantum Systems Accelerator. And uh, finally, the entire group uh, for being just incredible and supportive and always welcoming a chemist in their midst. Um, and all of you, any questions? Let's see what's going on in the chat. Cool. Good question. Yeah. You know, I thought it was going to be last summer, but then it turned out I still like it. <laughs> Grad school is hard. Um, but so maybe on my deathbed. Darren. It's like you have, so you have two beams of titanium. Yes. Uh, why two of them? Are you hedging your bet that one of them might? work better than the other or are there like interesting differences between them we're hedging our bets that one or the other won't work at all <laughs> so no oh yeah totally um so the question was we have two beams and not zero but why two beams um and the answer is uh as as darren alluded to we are hedging our bets um well basically the the the, the real answer is um until we have laser cooled titanium we can't know for sure which beam source is going to work better. So for example, the titanium sublimation pump um, approach has the, has the advantage that it's very vacuum clean, right? It's literally a vacuum pump. Um, your atoms are, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very vacuum clean um, and it's easy, right? It's, it's accessible. You, 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 you can buy these pumps pretty standard. They're not expensive. You don't have to build an enormous crazy system. So there's beauty in the simplicity. On the other hand, um, there's not nearly as many atoms as you get in ablation. And you don't have this kind of uh, given metastable population. So then in the ablation source, right, you get your 10% atom of your atoms in the and the metastable state, you also get higher atom numbers, but you also have to deal with the fact that, you know, these ultra cold atomic systems need to be present in really pristine environments, like 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 tour, like outer space vacuum level vacuum. And pumping tons of argon into your system isn't necessarily conducive to ultra high vacuum. So we've got to take a lot of extra steps in that system to, um, to mitigate those factors. It's also more complicated and you have to use a really scary ablation laser that, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, if you're not careful, it'll take you out. It's a very powerful, scary laser. Um, uh, so there's, there's benefits and, uh, you know, uh, detractions from each system, but then even more simply, we just kind of sat down a year and a half, two years ago and laid out all the options. The, and we were like, okay, we have three grad students, these two are the most likely options to build these things. And so they really developed in parallel. Um, it, it would be a race if we were at all competitive, but we're a pretty good team. And so, you know, it's, we're, it's, 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 they're, they're being developed in parallel, but yeah, thanks for your great question. Any other questions? Rowan. Yeah. Yeah, totally the, uh, the, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so Ron asked, um, you know, of those options at the beginning of the talk, which I, I'll slowly go back to as I uh, read the question or repeat the question, um, which do I think titanium is like best suited for and which am I most excited for? 
Um, so I guess that, that's a, here we go. So I guess I'll say right now, I think, I think titanium is really well suited for the quantum simulation aspect of things. So uh, all of this, uh, all of this jazz I mentioned, um, these advantages, titanium being this kind of Goldilocks element, makes it perfect for a certain class of quantum simulations, like of real materials. And so I think this would give us just a really elegant way to do some simulations that people have been kind of fighting to do with these other classes of atoms. Um, and I think these would also lead to really important discoveries. Uh, so that is something I'm really psyched about. And I think titanium is extremely well suited to that. That's like a bit farther off because these are like really difficult, complicated experiments. So um, while I think titanium, you know, in the long run is best suited for that, in the short run, you might be able to make a really cool clock out of titanium. Um, basically, some of the systematic effects that plague current atomic clocks are for, you know, complicated quantum reasons, not as bad in titanium. And the wavelengths you'd need, the wavelengths of lasers you'd need to make a titanium atomic clock are in pretty standardly accessible like frequency ranges. And so you might be able to like build a, it might not be the best atomic clock on the planet, but it might be one that you could put all over the planet. And this would let you make kind of a network of atomic clocks that you could use for say like extraordinarily precise quantum sensing. Um, so, you know, atomic clocks are getting to the point nowadays where you can actually resolve like the gravitational energy shift to 10 centimeters. And if you had clocks all over the world that were sensitive enough to resolve these frequency differences, you could, you know, like measure the changes in like how the earth is moving, do like earthquake prediction or something like that. And I personally don't think that's as cool just for the fundamental science reasons. I think quantum simulation is cooler, but it's a really sweet application. And like, you know, we, we, we just published a, preprint on archive describing the, the you know, a titanium uh, clock experiment. So I think those two are really the spot. And then of course, you know, ultra cold chemistry, like I don't deal with molecules or think about chemistry anymore, but um, anytime you add a new element to chemistry, you, you know, exponentially increase the number of reactions you might be able to access. So who knows, maybe somebody will make some cool titanium uh, ultra cold molecules. I don't want anything to do with it, but you know, <laughs> maybe somebody else does. Yeah. Uh, when you were learning all of these new techniques in the lab, like how to reverse lasers back in the late systems, did you have any close calls where that were kind of like, oh, I don't know if I should be doing this, you kept going? I'd say that happened most days. <laughs> and so the, the question was, as I'm learning to work with all this, like, you know, crazy physics equipment, like lasers, lathes, um, you know, all this stuff is there has there been any times where i've been like had close calls have been like whoa like you know i really don't know what i'm doing here and um i guess i guess no I, and and my answer is basically every day but that's that's an exaggeration there, there's definitely been times where i'm just like you know it's like oh right i almost forgot that there's a beam path there but almost always if it's free space it's a it's a you know laser beam that's low enough power that even if you took a direct hit you you know your blink reflex would save you but it's like whoa right yeah i'm you know i gotta get used to thinking about the fact that there's lasers like everywhere all the time um there's i'd say i've mitigated that to my benefit or detriment whichever one you want to choose by being excruciatingly paranoid um so like okay, our fancy $100,000 laser is on the fritz and it needs some work on it. I think I know what to do, but also maybe pushing this button will destroy it and ruin all of us. So maybe I'll wait for my lab mate Scott to get in because he knows what's going on and can teach me. Um, and I'm starting to get to the point now after two and a half years in this group where I'm like, oh, burp, 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 burp. oh yep, it broke, like whatever. Um, but uh, it, it, it took a while. <laughs> There, there, there's, yeah, I've had many moments where I'm like, whoa, maybe I'm too stupid to be doing this. And, you know, that's how it's phrased in your brain. And the real answer is, whoa, I have a steep learning curve and don't know what I'm doing right now. Um, but yeah, luckily there hasn't really been any like 
whoa, I probably should be at a computer right now instead of doing this. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming.